Hey there and welcome back. In this video we're going to dive straight into the player movement now, so we're going to get the player moving between its lanes. And of course the first thing that we need is the actual input bindings, so we'll get that out of the way to begin with. To do this we're just going to go over to the project settings, we'll go to the input settings, and we just want two different action mappings. If you're not aware already, the difference between action and axis mappings, action mappings are more for things like single press inputs, so like we're going to have left and right, there's no variation between that, it's either pressed or not, and axis mappings are things like analog where you can get a range between something like zero being the analog stick not moved, uh, 0 0.5 when the analog is halfway uh, pushed forward, and then one when it's fully pushed forward. So we don't need the axis for this, we just want to find out if and when something has been pressed. So we're going to add two action mappings. The first one we'll call left, and the second one we'll call right. Under both of these we just need to add the buttons that we want to act as the left and right movement. So for left I'm going to get the left arrow key, which simply falls under left. And I'll also add another one for the A key. So if we just type A, we need to scroll down and find the A option. And again for right, we need another one of these. The first one will be the right arrow key, which again falls under right. And then I'll just use D as the other option in case you've gotten used to WASD. So these are going to be the inputs which control the movement of the player. With that done, we can go back to the pawn base. And this is the reason I wanted to get the level manager created first of all is because we're instantly going to need some references to the level manager class and we now have that set up and ready to go. Now the first thing I'd usually do is get a reference to the level manager which is uh, quite a simple thing to do but rather than doing that inside of the pawn base because we already know that a lot of our functionality is going to be based around the level manager quite a lot of things are going to need to know about it get some information from maybe how fast the obstacles should be moving whether or not they've touched the level manager bounds the pawn class is going to need to know how wide the lanes are, so how far it should move, and things like that. We already know that a lot of these different classes will be making a very similar request to get information from the level manager. So what I'm going to do is show you how we can drop this into a really convenient thing called a macro library. So if we go back to the content folder to begin with in the blueprints, I'm going to right click, create a blueprint class, and we can find it down here, the blueprint macro library. And I'm just going to make this a standard actor class, and we'll call this the bpm underscore lib. Now normally you might want to specify this a little bit more, but I know that we probably only need one of these macro libraries, so just calling it the general library is going to be perfectly fine. And if you're not familiar with these, all it does is, of course, inside of any class, you can create a macro, which is just kind of a smaller condensed function for handy reusable logic that you might need multiple times. Uh, of course, if you do this in a class, then that will only be callable in that class. The only difference here is that as long as this is in the project, any class will get access to the functions in this macro library. So like I said, really simple check. All we want to do is get all actors of class. So we'll find all actors of class. The class that we want is our level manager. And we want to get the first object found because we should only have one level manager per map. So we're going to get a copy. Uh, we want to plug the execution node into the input. We want to check off of the returned value whether this is valid. And we want the option with the question mark because this gives us the uh, is valid or not valid return. We're going to plug the execution pin in here. We'll move the outputs and we just want to plug the is valid in and the is not valid. So this works very similar. It means that we don't need to do this is valid check in every class. This is going to be assumed anyway. But we still have the option to do specific logic depending on whether or not this returns valid or not valid. Now on top of this we also want to get the value which is returned or the object which is found and plug that in and I'm doing this just because it gives us automatic naming so we don't need to worry about naming the outputs and we now have everything which is relevant to trying to find the level manager. So if we save this we can go back to the pawn base and on event begin play before that though we also need to name this it just names it the new macro zero and I'm just going to press F2 and we'll call this get level manager. So again make sure that we save this and go back to the pawn base again pull off of the event begin play and we'll find the get level manager macro we've just made. Okay so we can see that just here we know it's a macro because we've got this small gear icon and as expected we have the returned value of is valid, not valid and the output. So what we want to do like you would off of the standard is valid check we're going to pull off of the output we're going to promote this to a variable so we only need to do this once and we're going to call this one the level manager ref okay and then only if this is valid are we going to plug that in. So if this has returned something, then we're going to plug that in and store that as a reference. Now, of course, if you want to take this a step further, 
we can start doing things like error checks. So if it's not valid, then we want to do something like a print string and just give a warning saying uh, no level manager found. And maybe something even a little bit more in depth like all maps need a level manager um, just to prompt you if you've forgotten to put it in, then we know that the game just isn't going to work if it doesn't have these variables. So this is just going to be our safety check and it also gives us a nice quick and easy way to get a reference to our level manager. And then we can do this in any other class that we make. Okay, so we now have a reference to the level manager, which means we can get some of the important information that we need. So if we control drag the level manager ref back in, the first thing we want to do is get the number of lanes. So we'll get the number of lanes from the level manager so we know the distances that we have to move. From this, I'm going to promote this to a variable just because we already have the integer type that we need. And I'm going to call this one the current lane. Now, we're going to unhook that. That was just a little bit of laziness, so I didn't have to create a new variable and assign a type. I'm going to plug that in up here, so we're going to set the current lane straight away. And the way that I'll do this, and this is completely up to you to change this as you see fit, but I'll pull off of the number of lanes that we have. I'm going to divide this by an integer, which is I'm going to divide by 2. I'm going to add one to the return value. So we'll add one to the value which is returned, and then we'll plug this into the current lane. This is quite simply just going to get the midway point of the number of lanes available. So if we've got three lanes, it's going to return lane two, and so on, so that you're always kind of starting in the middle. And that's why I like the odd number, is it just looks a little bit better starting directly in the middle. Now, of course, if you wanted your game to always start in the left-hand lane or the right-hand lane, then you can either assign lane zero or the maximum number of lanes, completely up to you. Uh, just to explain what that logic's doing and why I've taken that approach though. Okay, so that's our first thing done. Next thing is again, we're going to get a reference to the level manager. We can pull off of this and then I just want to get the lane width. Okay, so get lane width. And again, from this, we're going to pull from the lane width and we'll promote this to another variable. And we can just call this exactly the same thing. We'll just rename this one to be lane width. And that's quite simply because I don't see that changing uh, dynamically. This is something which is going to be set in the editor. The lane width should probably stay the same throughout gameplay. Uh, it just means that that way we don't need to keep referencing this directly from the level manager. We can find out what this is at the start of play. Uh, and then we can always call our local version to this class during that level. Now this is pretty much everything I think we need to do at the beginning of play. So I'm going to remove these nodes. I'm going to grab everything that we have here. I'm going to right click on one of the nodes that we have and I'm going to collapse this into its own function. I'm just going to call this one initialize. Probably do this for a lot of the classes that we make. This is just to keep things nice and tidy. We've now got just the single node here uh, and this is where we're going to set up all of the values. And if we find that we want to start adding things like uh, references to other classes, widgets or anything on begin play, then we can just drop that straight into our new initialize function. For now though, that's pretty much all that we need to do. So I'm going to go back to the event graph and just very quickly add in the input bindings. So we have our two input bindings. We have left. So if we find left and we have right, they're going to be doing some very similar logic. So we can copy a lot, a lot of this between them. Uh, but if we focus first of all on left and just take some time to consider why we're doing things the way we are. So what we want to do is get the current lane that we're in. Uh, we want to find out whether or not we are less than or equal to one on the current lane. So less than or equal to integer. We'll check this is one. And we're going to pull off and do a branch check here. And if we just give this a comment, so when we come back, we know what this is doing. So we'll add a comment. And this is just to check if we have press left whilst we're already in the leftmost lane. Okay, so if that's false, then we know that we have somewhere to move. Uh, so we want to do another branch check. And this branch check, actually, we're going to use this to promote this to a variable. So promote that, and we'll call this one be moving. So we'll find out whether or not we're currently moving. This is just going to stop us from double tapping whilst we're still in the movement phase, uh, which would let us do things like go out of bounds or move past the number of lanes we actually have. We will set this one to be, uh, we'll hit compile, make sure we always set this to be false to begin with. And then again, if this is false, then that means we are now allowed to move. So we want to reset the moving Boolean. So this is how we're gonna be tracking whether or not we're moving and we'll set this to true now. Okay, so I'm gonna take the lane width next over here and I'm going to duplicate this and call this one the target position. And we're going to set what the target position is because we don't want this to be set uh, reset whilst we are making the calculation a bit later. So the target position is going to be the current actor location. So we'll get actor location. We want to split the structure pin so that we have access just to the Y axis. We're going to be moving left and right on the Y axis. Uh, we want to get a float minus a float. And you can probably see where this is going. So we're going to get where we are at the moment minus the lane width, so the distance to travel. And we're going to plug that into the target position. 
And then the last couple of things to finish off the movement function, we want to add a timeline. I'm going to call this one move left and we want to make sure that this always plays from the start rather than uh, just play. And we just want to double click into this so that we can create a simple timeline. Uh, we want to make the length really, really short. We're going to make this 0.1 uh, so that it doesn't take very long to transition between lanes. And this is going to be a float curve. If we zoom in a bit, we actually, uh, I'm going to give this four different points just to make this a bit more interesting. The first one I'm going to set at 0, 0. The next one I'm going to set to 0 0.01 and 0. So a time of 0 0.01 and make sure that the value stays at 0. The next one is going to be 0 0.09 and a value of 1. And then the final one will be at 0.1 on the time and a value of 1 again. So we can just hit the uh, horizontal and vertical buttons here so that we can kind of get all of this into uh, the viewport so that we can make this a bit easier to see. And I'm going to drag select all of these, right click on any one of them and set this to auto. And we're just going to get a little bit of a curve down here. And um, we can kind of accentuate this a little bit if you wanted to on the curve, just so it's going to kind of hop to the side a bit and then back with a sharp turn to uh, the location it's trying to go. And of course you can play about with this and make it look however you wanted on the curves. Okay, so that one is done. We can go back to our event graph and for the duration of this being done, what we want to do is set the act location on update. So set act location. We're going to split the structure pin and we want to get the current act location again. Okay, so like we did previously, we're going to split the structure pin. Just notice it says track zero. So I'm gonna come back in and uh, rename this one to move. Okay, sorry, and uh, back to the event graph. We're going to get the values that we have here. So we want to stay where we were on the X axis. Definitely want to stay where we were on the Z axis. And then we want to make the Y axis a lerp value. So we're going to lerp between two float. We're going to lerp from where we are on the Y axis to where we want to be, which remember we've promoted this earlier, which is the target position. So lerp to the target position. And this is going to be based or this is going to be carried out over the move alpha that we've created. And then as soon as this is finished, because this is moving left, so we're going down a lane, we want to first of all set the moving boolean back. So set moving back to false. So that's going to allow us to move again if possible. And we also want to get the current lane. So I'm going to control drag this in. I'm going to do a decrement integer. So just press minus minus twice. So we'll decrement this so that we're tracking which lane we're currently in after the movement. And apologies about my uh, the budgie. He seems to want to talk whenever I talk. And that is going to be our left movement done though. So that's the first one done. And like I said, a lot of this is going to be easily reusable. So we'll just move that down a bit more. Uh, we want our branch check again. So we're going to do the same sort of check for the right movement. So get the current lane. We want to find out whether or not this is equal to, so equal to the total number of lanes in the level manager. So we can just get this reference once. Uh, we'll pull off of this and we'll get the number of lanes. And again, we're just going to do a branch check here. Drag around this, hit C for a comment and this is just going to be a check to see whether we've pressed right in the rightmost lane. And like we did previously, if that's false, so if we still have room to move, then we're going to do our other branch check. And this is going to be, uh, all of this actually is the same. So I'm just going to copy all of this. And we're going to change the values where required. So we'll copy and paste this down. We'll plug this in from the false check. So we want to do the same thing again. We'll find out if we're moving. If we're not, then that means we can move. So we'll set this to moving. The obvious difference that we need to change here is that we don't want to take the lane width away. We're going to be moving right, which is a positive value. So we'll do the Y axis plus a float this time. So float plus float. So this is going to be plus the lane width. We'll plug that into the target position. Uh, same again, we can rename the timeline if you want to uh, change this to move right. The timeline inside should be the same, which is exactly what we need. Uh, that's probably going to be a bit extreme, but that's fine. Um, and then finally, there's a few things we're going to need to change over here. So as you can probably see, the, the actual movement of the, uh, the location is fine. So we're going to be still going from where we are to the target position because that is kind of irrelevant because we're setting that to be over here. So the logic's going to be the same based on the alpha of the move. And then of course, like we did previously, we don't want this to be minus minus. We're moving right, so it's going to be a plus a lane. So we're going to say plus plus. So we'll increment that. And now we have our left and right movement. Well, in fact, let's just add the camera on now. So we'll go to add components. We're going to add a spring arm and we're going to add a camera component to the spring arm. 
We also want the static mesh, and I'm just going to call this one the player. So make sure you add a static mesh. We'll add this. Uh, we'll attach that to the default scene root. And the static mesh, we're going to set this to be our cube that we've created. Uh, we'll hit compile, go to the viewport, make sure that we zero the site because some weird movement stuff happened there. Uh, we'll set the spring arm to be a little bit further back, maybe about 600 on the arm length. And we can rotate this as well. So we'll just rotate this to look down on the player. Hit compile save that now when we press play with that done we should have our camera uh, the <laughs> color choices here are terrible two more things we need to do to actually test this is we're just going to move a cube in put this in the zero location in the world i'm going to spread this out a little bit so that we can get a kind of idea of the reference of where we are and we'll give this a color so we can see this against the uh, the white cube so we'll just make this gray for now so we should spawn in and we can see that when we press left and right we are indeed moving uh, there's a bit of a sharp look on the movement there, but that's perfectly fine. But we can see that the actual movement is working. We, uh, we have that nice sharp lane movement, and we can also see that if we move more, try and move more than three times, we have the maximum limit of the three lanes as well. So again, just to show how we can quickly update this, we can go to the level manager. We can make this, uh, let's say, five lanes, and we can make the distance 500 or something. And this just shows how quick and easy it is going to be to iterate on different things here. So we can see that this is five lanes with a unit of 500. Uh, and that took a matter of seconds to change that, but it's completely changed the game style. So you can really quickly iterate to find out the, the game style and the, the way that you want your game to play. So that is the setup of the pawn class. A little bit longer than I usually like to make a single video, so I'm going to leave that one here for today. Uh, but that is pretty much all of the important things done in the player class. As always, if you enjoyed the video or find these useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That always helps. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And as ever, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.